Welcome to Packet Pushes, a podcast on the data networking industry where real engineers get together to talk deeply, technically, wistfully nerdy. A place where we can talk so fast that you can't even hear what we are saying because we use multiple lanes for conversation. In the data center where everything is an equal cost multipath network, there's just too much to be said. Excited? Of course you are, because when real engineers get together, we don't have to apologize for talking tech, waving our hands at the virtual whiteboard, breathing the hot air in the hot aisle, and pretending that we know what all the technical discussion is about. Today's show, we are talking with Alcatel Lucent Enterprise and NEC America about a partnership bringing SDN solutions to your data center and particularly around providing SDN capabilities to a uh, an Ethernet underlay that you just might not have considered. This idea of SDN being more than just a unified solution that has to come from a single vendor because you don't know if it's going to work together. These two companies have partnered to show you what it's like to actually put someone's software with someone's hardware, but not in the way that you might think. So let's kick things off and first of all introduce Subash Bora from Alcatel Lucent Enterprise. Hi, Subash. Tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Hey, Greg. Uh, my name is Subash Bora. I am the product line manager at uh, Alcatel Lucent Enterprise, uh, working uh, on, on uh, the data center side and as well uh, as managing some of the OmniSwitch uh, product lines. Ah, well, welcome to the Packet Pushers. It's your first time in, is that right? Yeah. And uh, I look forward to talking to you. And also with us today is Tashal Dawala from NEC America. Tashal, tell the people a little bit about yourself. Good morning, guys. Uh, my name is Toshal Dudwala. I'm a senior product manager for NEC Corporation of America. I primarily manage uh, the programmable flow product line for NEC. Welcome to Bag of Pushes. So what we want to talk about today is this joint project between Alcatel, Lucent Enterprise and NEC. So why don't we just kick off and say, why are you doing it together and what is the scope of this project? Uh, basically, in the SDN arena, uh, today it's all about bringing in open platforms so that enterprises and cloud providers don't see this as a single vendor lock-in solution. Okay, ALU uh, Enterprise and uh, NEC joint solution enables a multi-site, multi-tenant data center network that automates um, time-consuming and disruptive tasks of configuring uh, the underlay network today. Uh, and, and on top of it, supporting a dynamic movement of uh, virtual machines, providing a single-touch uh, orchestration network yeah. to the data center team. That's the objective. That's what we are solving. So what we're actually saying here is this is an end-to-end orchestration of virtual machines, virtual networks, and the physical network itself using products from Alcatel, Lucent Enterprise, and NEC to achieve that. Correct. Okay. Which is quite a thing, right? Because it's normally what we've heard up until now is that, you know, NEC is doing it with NEC switches, you know, Vendor X is doing it with Vendor X's switches, and, you know, we're using yeah. pseudo open standards, but, <laughs> you know, not. Yeah, that, that's all exactly what popped into my head. It's, it's been yeah. the, it's still been vertically integrated in some way because everybody's been demoing it on their own gear to have some cross platform stuff is pretty fascinating. No, absolutely, and that's uh, that's NEC's uh, been always been op- uh, being open about SDN, and uh, the we were the first one in the market to adopt the open flow, which being touted as the open fro- protocol for SDN. And uh, since last couple of years, we're making sure that our platform is not only works with our own switches, NEC switches, but also our partner switches, and that's what we are doing with the Alcatel Lucent Enterprise uh, switches. So we're making sure that. Our customers have a choice of picking um, their the networking device as they would with their their servers or their compute device. So, okay, so just hearing about some of the summary of that uh, solution, there you're using Alcatel hardware now. You know, as I've been familiar with Programmable Flow, you guys have been doing this for a few years now with this product. It was OpenFlow talking to NEC switches that was making an end-to-end uh, underlay solution, physical data center, and and now you're saying you can also program with the Programmable Flow controller. Uh, Alcatel gear as well? Is that how the match is being made? That's correct, so, uh, yeah. To, to, to add to that, Ethan, uh, I think the OpenFlow standard has, uh, has, has really evolved. We have, uh, we have uh, Alcatel Lucent Enterprise as such has been participating in those forums and, and then evolving that, uh, that, that protocol and standard. But uh, uh, together with NEC, uh, we are really uh, extending this, uh, this umbrella and uh, jointly integrating the underlay platform into the programmable flow controller. 
Right. And to, to add to what Subhas just mentioned, a couple of years ago, uh, the open flow as a, as a standard wasn't evolved. So when we initially launched our solution uh, four years ago now, we had to make some proprietary extensions in our product to make it work and make the open flow our solution carrier grade. But then since we worked at the ONF, we're making sure those extensions are implemented as a standard. And then a lot of those extensions are available as part of OpenFlow 1.3. And that allows us to now work with any OpenFlow switch. Um, of course, we need to make sure those uh, are interoperable. But technically, they are. we can now work with any uh, OpenFlow 1.3 switch in the market. So Okay, so what you're saying is OpenFlow 1.0, right, had a, a limited feature set. It could do some basic things, but to do some of the more interesting stuff, as you said, to make things carrier grade, you had to have some, NEC put some extensions in there to uh, you know, enhance the ability of OpenFlow running on the NEC hardware to be able to do those you know, more interesting things, some of the stuff you're doing in virtual tenant networks and so on. Now you're saying, yeah, but we've given those extensions back to the ONF, and those extensions have been baked into OpenFlow 1.3, which is really where we're at, various iterations of OpenFlow 1.3. And uh, and so that's a standard that anyone who is OpenFlow 1.3 uh, conformant, I think is the right word in ONF parlance, should be able to, uh, to, to work with a programmable flow controller. And Alkaloo is uh, one of the examples of that. Absolutely. And I mean, we've been partnered with uh, uh, Alcada Lucent Enterprise for last one year. We're working very closely with them as well. And both the teams are working hard to make sure that uh, the solution we are putting together is a carrier grade as well. So it's not just we saying, hey, you can put Alcada Lucent uh, and NEC together. There's a lot of work which went behind the scene to to validate that uh, that statement as well. There's a lot tied into the hardware here, right? Because... Uh, a switch can be tested as OpenFlow 1.3 uh, conformant, but that doesn't necessarily mean it does all OpenFlow 1.3 functions in hardware, that it can do them you know, at the same scale that, uh, that another switch can that could also be tested as conformant. So you know, I assume we're talking about, since you're talking about carrier grade, being able to do everything the programmable, programmable flow controller wants it to do at scale and in hardware. Is that fair? That's correct. And I mean, Subhas can speak more about their hardware capabilities on Alcatel Lucent switch. But in a nutshell, yes, that's correct. And uh, when you say conformant, even the ONF, and that's a completely different topic, but ONF itself, they've realized that. And even in their 1.3 conformance, they have, uh, I think, two or three options uh, as well. But that's, I guess I said, it's a completely yeah, different Yeah, you're topic. right, they do. Yeah, I'd forgotten about yeah. that. Right. Yeah. Mm. Just to add to it, basically, the OmniSwitch platform is just not a platform that provides the 10 gig and the 40 gig pipes and the low latency that's required in the data center today. But in addition, it provides a broad set of open interfaces, open flow being one. There is a rich set of uh, RESTful APIs that can be leveraged for uh, for programmability aspect of it as well. And, uh, and the switches have inbuilt Python scripting on it so that an IT personnel who is very techy can uh, optimize the workflow or event management, I would so call it, based on his own personal uh, needs. That's the broad set of what the OmniSwitch platform brings in the data center aspect of uh, of things. With respect to OpenFlow in general with NEC, there are a couple of extensions that, that we had to go ahead and uh, integrate and uh, bring uh, as part of this solution. That really is what is leveraging and bringing the whole solution to being carrier grade. You know, some of them mm. being that uh, by in general within the OpenFlow set uh, by default, there is no uh, VLAN checking that happens at the egress, but that's something that is a VLAN gate functionality that NEC has proposed to the uh, forum, and we incorporated that. That really is is very helpful in building scalable data center solutions, leveraging SDN technology. Yeah, you're talking about the ability to uh, to, to manipulate 802.1 Q tags as a way to identify uh, tenant traffic. Correct. That's yeah. correct. Yeah. So yeah, what I mean, when build on that notion of carrier grade. I mean, uh, you know, a lot of the folks that listen to this show are, are maybe have some enterprise background. We certainly have some service provider folks too. What would be different? Uh, what features are you looking for so that you can label the solution carrier grade? There are a couple of things uh, that come to my mind. Uh, then, uh, first thing is that not only are the underlay network is is enabling uh, capability so that the programmable flow controller can really build a seamless provisioning 
for an end-to-end uh, data center for the underlay network, uh, be it a virtual switch that sits inside Hyper-V or, or mm-hmm. uh, the any other uh, virtualized host, mm-hmm. I would put it that way. It goes and programs seamlessly for end-to-end the virtual switch and the underlay fabric physical infrastructure, getting instructions from the orchestrated tool and seamlessly provisions end-to-end network uh, with the capability to understand applications and apply policies uh, at at a virtual tenant level. You know, you, you you don't want to look at it. You don't want IT to be managing QS policies on every single switch independently. It does it at the virtual tenant network. Oh, it's so much fun to manipulate those policies, though. It's just <laughs> it's just a joy of every network engineer's life. <laughs> from, a, from, a, from a service, uh, what you call uh, provisioning and definition standpoint, the IT person is only uh, now responsible for provisioning services and managing the policies around those services. He's not going to be looking at the underlay infrastructure at all. That's the beauty. Yeah, so that's the key part here is that you can actually configure this network from directly within Microsoft's system center. So NEC programmable flow uh, platform has been deeply integrated into Microsoft's system center. So when you're inside of the SCVMM, you can actually configure the entire network, not just the, the, the Hyper-V switch. You can actually configure the whole thing end-to-end. Toshal, do you want to sort of talk to that for a bit? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the initial promise of SDN was the network agility, right? Uh, everyone said, well, the, the compute has gone light year ahead, but the network is still stuck in that old 80s and 90s network. We need the agility in the network. Well, with this integration, we are making it a reality. So we, what we have done, we have worked with Microsoft, we have developed the plugin which sits inside the Microsoft uh, System Center Virtual Machine Manager, or say SCVMM. And with that, your network or your system admin doesn't need to worry about the network. The network is, it's automatically configures for you, depending upon the services you want to run in your in your system, in, in this case, the, the Hyper-V virtualization. When you say services, are you talking about, um, you know, well, service insertion is one of the topics that comes up in these sorts of conversations where you can, you know, off, off of a menu of services, say, I want this tenant to push traffic through these things, a firewall perhaps, or a load balancer, that kind of stuff, or you know, something more general? That to me is more uh, service chaining or service insertion. Um, okay. yeah, I, yeah. I'm actually referring to even the step before that when your services are instantiated in the in your network, mm-hmm. uh, you don't want to go and then configure the network for those services. For an example, uh, let's say you're configuring uh, a new link server in this case, a uh, link being the Microsoft uh, Enterprise Web solution, the telephony solution. Um, in that case, you don't want the network to then go and configure for to making sure those QoS policies are configured in the network for that applications. You want that to happen automatically. So with this integration, when those services or the VMs in this case are instantiated on the network, the controller talks to the, the system center virtual machine manager talks to our controller and that it automatically configures the required policies uh, through the controller on the network. So it's it's seamless. It is this end-to-end orchestration vision. You're inside of SCVMM. You configure a Hyper-V virtual machine. You add it to the network, and then the rest of the network is configured. So it it, it, it says this this Hyper-V needs to be in this VLAN. That Hyper-V server is on this physical port of the Alkalu physical enterprise switch. It just provisions everything underneath it. Does the VLAN trunking? It does the VLAN creates the VLAN if that's what needs to be done. It's that whole piece from within SCVMM. Right, that and whole- all the re- right, right, and all the required policies. And not only that, when your VM migrates, which is inevitable in the data center, those migrations are also triggered to the controller, and the policies are also then being migrated to the new locations of the VM as well. So not only on the hypervisor side, but also on the network side, in this case, the Alcatel Lucent switch. There's an additional component what we have built, which is the our virtual switch called PF1000. That's the open flow enable virtual switch available mm-hmm. for Hyper V environment, mm-hmm. and that's free free for anyone to download. That doesn't require you to pay or anything. You can just download that switch, put it on your mm-hmm. Hyper V, and you have an open flow. Yeah. And then some other vendors have- want to charge you for the virtual switch functionality. Exactly. We, we well, say, all of them actually. <laughs> 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 right. So, <laughs> just thought I'd mention that. 
because that's react- up, right? When you're paying either per hypervisor or like per server or you're paying per right. VM, those costs prevent you from getting bigger. Because if every Absolutely. time you have to turn around and buy another license for a VM switching, you know, or every time you buy another hypervisor, not only do you have to pay for the, the hypervisor license, but also switching licenses as an added extra, it just gets time consuming and wasteful and, you know, enormously painful. And, and, and that could scale up very fast. I mean, you're, you're talking about easy 40 servers per rack, depending on the scale, your, your CapEx investment could just go high. I, I got to ask you guys, why Microsoft? And, I, and here's the context of that question. Everybody that comes on this show seems to want to talk about OpenStack. Well, we integrate with OpenStack. You know, we, we work with Neutron and, and so on and so on for, you know, your orchestration platform. But you guys are dealing with the Microsoft stuff. How come? I think Microsoft, if you see what's happening, uh, they're initiating, uh, I mean, over the last couple of years, uh, we know Microsoft was uh, was more um, not inclined towards cloud. It was taking sub steps, but if you see in the last two three years, they have ramped up uh, quite drastically in the uh, in the data center space, and yeah. they are in the top three names from a data center perspective. And moving to the cloud, Microsoft is one of them. That's one. And secondly, I think Microsoft is a common platform in most of the enterprises today. And that's certainly something that we we can leverage and uh, and and take the solution to fusion and, and and it would relevant make make it more relevant to customers when we speak to them. To add to what Subhas said, I mean, we just don't want to come come to to this podcast and says, hey, we me two kind of solution. I mean, having we have an OpenStack solution today. The NEC programmable flow is integrated with the OpenStack. But rather than we just come and says, well, we also have the OpenStack. We want to bring to the market which none of the other vendors can offer today, which is the complete integration, end-to-end integration with uh, something like a Microsoft environment. Yeah. I think it's really interesting that Microsoft products, now in the past I've been somewhat critical of Microsoft because they're not always predictable. That is, I can't always predict that a Microsoft feature will work this way and that it will stably and and reliably continue to, to do the things that I predicted it will do. But notwithstanding, it is by and, far and away the most popular solution that people have for building uh, operating systems, especially in the mid to large enterprise. So there's a lot of enterprises who use Microsoft end-to-end inside of their systems, and that's the way they go. So this ability to do this in Microsoft's platform is something that's been ignored by nearly all the other vendors to some, like to a lesser or greater degree. But you know, you're unique in this feature, I think. Right, right. And that's what we wanted to bring to the table. And for all those, uh, our customers who's looking for uh, Microsoft-based uh, orchestration and solution, uh, we wanted to bring to the table that we have a legit SDN solution uh, and fully integrated with the Microsoft. Yeah, and you hit on something earlier that I think was really important too, which is you know, the OpenStack folks are kind of a small number of very large customers, and so maybe a lot of vendors get excited about that, and then the market that, <laughs> the vast majority of the market that is using a lot of Microsoft stuff gets overlooked because it's not as trendy or their CapEx is not as big. And yet, right. there's a huge market there. You know, you, you can hardly go wrong going after people that are using Microsoft because the install base is massive. No, absolutely. And I mean, Microsoft. Uh, I mean, if you think about it, in last just few years with their whole Office 365, the cloud integration, and now with their um, Azure Cloud, I mean, they have taken their solutions to a completely different level. And I can't believe if I'm an enterprise, I I can't just ignore them. I have to look into the Microsoft solution because all my Office services are all Microsoft, so I would I should be looking into my data center as a legitimate here a competitor to a VMware or a KVM or OpenStack mm-hmm. to see if Microsoft can offer me the same value services. So let me ask about the Omni Switch itself. Now I'm not overly familiar with the Omni Switch in terms of scaling out. So obviously, it's not it's an Ethernet switch. It's got all the 10 gigs and 40 gigs. So I had a quick look at a brochure here, and you know all the part numbers that you might expect for switch models around the one RU fixed format switches. You've got the full range, but. What about if you've got to scale beyond two, four, or eight switches and you've got to start building ECMP cores or you want to build trees? What are the features in that sort of networking capability? How do you grow there? So uh, let me just give a brief introduction on the OmniSwitch 6900 platform that's enabling uh, this uh, this joint solution. The OmniSwitch 6900 platform, as you mentioned, yes, it's a, it's it comes in a one RU form factor. It's a platform series that has several different models. Uh, that allows you to scale from 10 gig to 40 gig, enabling provisions in the top of the rack and spine switch uh, as a spine switch in the data center, 
but also in uh, in, in the enterprise campus for aggregation and uh, core networks. The latency of, of this platform is uh, in the range of around 500 nanoseconds. And uh, that really is, uh, is, is, a, is a great push uh, for this platform uh, in, in the cloud. By latency, you're talking about port-to-port latency. You know, a, a frame comes in, frame goes out. It's, you know, 500 nanoseconds. Yes, uh, yes. Which is sub one microsecond, yeah. Correct, Half a microsecond, right, right, right. right. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty, pretty zippy. A lot of stuff. If you folks that don't look at the you know, switch hardware platforms out there and you know pay much attention to latency, some of the older Nexus gear is going to be you know a multiple of one microsecond or at one microsecond, and then when you start getting below one microsecond, you're getting into some pretty, pretty heavy breathing fast uh, kind of stuff. So 500 nanoseconds is, uh, uh, I don't think it's the fastest thing out there, but it's pretty blazing fast. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think just the one audio form factor brings in close to about 1.28 uh, terabits in, uh, in, in, in switching capacity or 2.56 if you do the, uh, do the math of uh, doubling. Uh, both your uh, or accounting for both RX and DX. Just to that, I think there are a couple of interesting features and functionalities uh, that that get enabled by this platform, and I certainly want uh, the listeners to be aware of this. The OmniSwitch platform has enabled uh, leveraging the application fluent network strategy that we initiated four years ago. Today, we are bringing something called as an intelligent fabric to reality. What this re- really means is it will enable your end-to-end network to get pre-configured out of the box. Leveraging uh, SPB protocol to provide a multi-path core, leveraging the functionality of SPBM, uh, but also your access with with the help of uh, dynamic uh, virtual network profiles that are embedded within the OmniSwitch platform allow end-to-end seamless connectivity and really uh, Pre-configures the network, so that's the beauty of the intelligent fabric uh, that's enabled on this platform. So what I'm hearing there is Alcatel Lucent's got the Ethernet switching capability that you would expect it to have. It's got a fabric capability based on SPBBM. So we've done several shows on SPB, so I think the, most of our audience would be familiar. But shortest path bridging is a form of layer two ECMP that allows you to extend VLANs to all very large size while not creating any loops, but allowing to use multiple paths between two points. So scales up the bandwidth without all the hassles of spanning tree. Basically, it gets away from spanning tree. Correct. Um, you're talking about support for VXLAN gateways. So where we have the Hyper-V functionality, we are able to terminate VXLAN overlay networks so you can escape out of the overlay into the underlay. <laughs> That's how I sometimes... You've got to get out... At some point, you have to get out of the overlay and down into the physical network so you can get to the internet or the WAN or or file, you know, legacy firewalls and things like that if you're not using software firewalls. So you're doing that. You've added in the open flow capability, obviously, because the NEC programmable flow is doing uh, using the open flow um, programming language to, to set up the flow state in the switch. But what you're also now saying is you've actually got extensions to this to do an auto-configuring fabric. So as soon as you start adding switches to the network, the switches start to say, oh, hey, I'm part of an existing fabric, I'll start to auto-configure myself. So- right, right. This, this basically will allow uh, lesser switches that needs to be managed uh, within, the, uh, within the network as you scale. And uh, and also uh, as you add nodes that that may be not compatible, uh, you know, as far as they are uh, standard based, they could connect and uh, become part of the same network, leveraging standard protocols like LACP and uh, MVRP that would allow uh, VLANs to propagate end to end and allow seamless connectivity. Cool. So NEC programmable flow is continuing to evolve. Toshal, I've been, you know, obviously looking at NEC programmable flow for the better part of three or four years. We've done shows, we've seen you at Field Day and other events. What's the progression from here? So you've got partnerships with Alcatel Lucent to do the Microsoft System Center progressions, futures. I don't know how much I can, I can, uh, I can disclose here, but everything. Oh, you can disclose uh, just, everything. It's just us. Oh yes, oh, it's, it's just, just us. Yeah. No one okay. but us and about eight thousand other people or so. Are <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's right. fine. We won't tell. Yeah, they won't tell anybody. You just ask them. (laughs) Well, so NEC, of course, uh, we are. This is just the beginning of the partnership. We are the partner ecosystem we are building. Uh, You might. We late last year we also announced what we call our SDN space um, that allows our uh, partners or ecosystem to also come and build the applications on top of our controller as well. And those are the enterprise class applications for security or for 
uh, network management applications. So that's the direction we are heading uh, towards. In terms of the feature sets, of course, uh, as I mentioned before, we have the OpenStack integration. We are making sure they are, it's more tightly coupled with the Neutron, uh, Neutron plugin as well mm. and the Open vSwitch. And uh, we just recently announced the partnership with VMware uh, on their VCOPS, or now it's called VRealize, where we are providing all the network health uh, information to the vCenter operation manager. So as a network admin, you have the complete visibility, not only your virtualized uh, compute, but also your, your physical network as well. And again, that, that partnership will evolve in the future as well. And uh, we have some of the some more amazing announcements and news coming out later in the in the year around Q3 timeframe that mm -hmm. will allow again the the scalabilities of the open flow uh, switches today uh, to go to the next level as well. So there's a there's a lot more things coming out later in the year as well. And this is as I said, this is just the beginning for us. Even though we've been here for four years, we are now in the uh, the second phase of the programmable flow solution. Yeah, everybody forgets how mature programmable flow is compared to a lot of the other solutions that are out there. I mean, you guys were one of the first to market with a working solution, and it keeps evolving. It's at version 6 now, right? Yeah, right. We just uh, launched version 6 last year, and we announced the version 6.1 at the networking field day or tech field day uh, last month as well. And uh, with that, uh, we released the VMware VRealize or VCOP solution, as I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, guys. So we've talked a lot about how this the whole thing works together, orchestrated and so on. So here's a thing. Since we're talking about Microsoft shops, I, I have an understanding that you can do some magic with uh, with the link application specifically. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, basically what this is all being enabled because of the openness of the overall platform that is enabled due to SDN. Okay, this open architecture further allows for uh, personal, personalized integration, wherein enterprise applications such as Microsoft Link can be provisioned, offering differentiated services. Uh, what I mean by that is there is an integration between Microsoft Link and the uh, controller, such that the uh, Microsoft Link signaling protocol can be provisioned where providing a higher quality of service in the underlay network. So it's the Microsoft signaling protocol, link signaling protocol, and the actual call communication that's, uh, that's going on can be provisioned through better quality of service profiles on your underlay network, differentiating and providing better end user experience. So that's the uh, value add that's being given. Just to qualify what you're really doing there, it sounds like the the controller is talking to Microsoft Link and getting call information, uh, figuring out call information between a couple of different endpoints. You know, they're going to be IP addresses out there on the network, and then figuring out all right, the path between these two uh, endpoints is X, whatever it is through the whole entire physical network, and then you're actually putting a QoS profile in place for the life of that call. That's correct. So right. there, there are two aspects of it. There is one, the signaling that goes on between the endpoint and the Microsoft Link server itself. So that signaling also needs to be in, uh, uh, needs to get prioritized. So that happens. And also the end-to-end -end, uh, call connection between the endpoints is also prioritized. Right. Gotcha. And, okay. And this happens uh, because the Link server, which sits in the data center uh, in this case, that it communicates with the Microsoft uh, System Center Virtual Machine Manager, right? And with that integration um, and the integration between the Microsoft SC VMM and the programmable flow controller, that actually closed the loop from the link server to the orchestration to the SDN controller back to the network. And that the whole loops basically ensures that there is an end-to-end uh, QoS set up for not just for signaling, as Subhas mentioned, but also for the actual call being set mm -hmm. up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, signaling, right. You just need to make sure the signal gets through so that uh, both ends know that a, a call needs to be stood up, uh, but doesn't need, you know, like, uh, you know, low jitter or anything. As long as it gets through, that's good. And then... Uh, and then the voice uh, and or video itself needs uh, some different sort of care and feeding. So yeah, yeah, it makes sense to, like you said, differentiated services. And if you're provisioning that on the fly in real time, that's 
<laughs> so, you know, QoS is one of those best effort things. You know, engineers, we, we, we get, we put in this position of, yeah, this voice, this network needs to be able to support voice traffic. Ah, oh, crap. Okay, fine. And you'd go and hammer your way through a template or that, you know, Cisco or whoever provided for you. And just, it's, it's a do your best, do your best and hope it works. And most of the time it kind of does. You know, if you've got something that's actually doing it in real time, in response to a call and in response to changing network environment, which this would be because it's going to be computing path end to end and the network topology might be different from one time to the next, that's something no human being could actually do. It takes software to do that and uh, to do it automatically is pretty awesome. Right. And that goes back to my original point of the network agility and what uh, the solution allows which is the programming the network for your application, not program your application depending upon your network. You guys are going to be at Interop, right? If folks want to see this thing, they can go to Interop? Absolutely. So we are jointly presenting this at the Interop Shownet floor. So this will be demonstrated there on the Interop Shownet floor. Interop is uh, currently being scheduled at the end of April in uh, Las Vegas, Mandalay Bay Convention Center. So the folks who wants to see more or live demo, it will be demonstrated there. And along with that, we, are, we will also be publishing um, what we call an application node or solution uh, guide or brief that will have a more details on the how actual solution works as well. So that will be available prior to the interop as well. Yeah, very good. Looking forward. I'll be at interop and, uh, and Greg, so will you. And uh, with luck, we'll stop by and see that. I'm hoping to. I always walk the show floor and look for fun things to watch. Just so that everybody is, is, uh, who's, who's going to be there should be aware that this is going to be part of the uh, SDN lab uh, as part of the IntropNet uh, floor. So um, sure. it's, sure not floor. Of, uh, the, yeah, it's not part of the yeah yeah it's not part of the the Alcatraz and Enterprise or, or NEC booth. It's part of the um, the ShowNet floor. Got okay, it. yeah, which is in a separate area of the show floor at Interop in Las Vegas. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I actually like to get tours there and go and talk to people who actually built the network and get horror stories. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, I won't be there. I will be at the NEC pool. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I never talk about them. Or, you know, maybe. <laughs> well, I think that's just about it for the show this week. And thanks for listening to the Packet Pushes. And thanks very much to Alcatel, Lucen and NEC for sponsoring today's show. I'd like to thank our guests uh, for joining us today. <laughs> uh, so, Toshal, why don't you tell people where they can find you on the internet? People can come visit the NECAM, N-E-C-A-M dot com slash SDN to learn more about the programmable flow solution. And if they want to reach out to me directly, they can find me on Twitter, handle T-D-U-D-H, T-D-U-D or on LinkedIn. Fantastic. And Subash, where can people find out more about Alcatel Lucent Enterprise? All right. So, uh, I mean, uh, of course, uh, you can go to enterprise.alcatel-lucent.com to find more about uh, the OmniSwitch uh, platform and uh, the solutions uh, that we offer. You can also find me on uh, LinkedIn uh, or on Twitter at Subash Bora. Fantastic. All right. So, Mr. Banks, any closing thoughts? I know that you're a font of wisdom because you're much closer to this sort of stuff because you've been playing in this area recently. Well, the... (sighs) You know the, the the world of SDN is still uh, matters, <laughs> and yeah. and here's the way I ask that we or way I way I say that we still get the the dismissive uh, emails and so on on Twitter and from uh, from folks, and yet the solutions continue to go on. So so a couple of thoughts here on this particular solution. One, it, we're moving more towards interoperable solutions, which I am personally very glad to see. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, vendor lock-in is one of those things that, yeah, if you got vendor lock-in, I guess you just kind of learn to deal with it. But if you can get interoperable solution, that's a better thing. And uh, it's nice to see NEC's controller, which has got a lot of powerful software there, able to deal with something other than just NEC switches. Not that they aren't good, but demonstrating the interoperability means customers end up with more choices, and that is good. And so I, I'm kind of digging this partnership. And of course, the uh, the link solution is, you know, there, there's a few other flavors of that you know, solution out there in the space, but not all of them actually provision QoS end-to-end. That's not exactly how, what, how they work or what they do. This does, and that's pretty keen. I'm, uh, I, I really think that's a very useful thing that anybody that's running Link can latch right onto and go, ooh, that's a problem that I have, and this would deal with that for me. So it's very, you know, very functional kind of a thing, too. That's good. 
It's good. Yeah, and I saw a demo of this just recently. I was watching some video of the actual configuring the SCVMM, and they just created a machine, and the whole thing just worked. So the, the Hyper-V created the NIC, the NIC SCVMM told the PFC controller to configure the physical switches, and away it went. It was awesome. Just imagine not having to finger bang the keyboard to configure VLANs all day and wear your little fingers to bloody stubs. That makes me happy. At some point, that's going to be huge. I mean, before this call, I spent hours on the phone with some other guys trying to bang our way through an application problem. You know, it wasn't a network problem. It was just, why the heck is this thing working right and, and dealing with all that stuff? When you can automate this thing with the right kind of constraints and automate some of the stuff away, take out the human configuration element, in, in theory, things are going to be better in the long run. So I'm looking forward to that world. On that note, thanks very much for listening to us, and we should be back again in a week or so. Make sure you come back. I'm Greg Farrow. You can find me on my blog at ethereummind.com or on the Twitter is at Ethereal Mind. You can find Mr. Banks on his blog at ethancbanks.com and on the Twitters as Ethan C. Banks. We'd love to hear your feedback about today's show, so don't feel shy about sending email to packetpushers at gmail.com and let us know what you're thinking. Alternatively, you can check out the podcast website at packetpushers.net, leave comments on today's show, or follow us on the Twitter as at packetpushers. And as always, remember that too much networking would never be enough.